Good morning. How are you today? Good, 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 sort of good. All right, all right. Thanks. Hey, you see the picture? That's what your bathrooms look like in here. Uh, so don't try to use them today, all right? Uh, if you need a restroom, we still have plenty of others. Uh, if you need a bathroom, bathroom, just go out the door there in the back. Come over here to the pavilion. Uh, this thing's popping again for some strange reason. All right. I'm just going to talk louder for a few minutes. Is that what we're going to do? Turn, turn me off. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> huh? Is that easy? Is that easy? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> also go into our jam center where the children's area is and there are restrooms in there you can also go to the office and there's two more restrooms there so we have plenty of them on the facility uh, we're uh, probably two more Sundays all right before we, uh, you can't use them the next two and by the third Sunday from now uh, you'll you'll be able to have brand new bathrooms they're gonna look so good so anyway we're uh, we're grateful to get that project uh, underway uh, let me highlight a few things and then a couple of prayer requests and we'll get engaged in our worship today. Tonight, tonight is the pasta feed, all right? You've been hearing about it for weeks and it's going to happen tonight. Uh, man, there's going to be a lot of good pasta here, lots of great salads. Uh, you can pick up tickets today in between the services out in the pavilion. They're $5 for dinner. Uh, that includes your food, your beverage. Uh, are we having dessert? We might have dessert. Uh, <laughs> But anyway, you're, gonna, you're not going to go away hungry, and uh, you can also get your raffle tickets this morning. You can also buy uh, at the door tonight both of those. We are trying something new for the first time, all right, so I'll tell you about this. We have recently acquired, all right, uh, a swipe card machine, okay? So if you're one of those guys who's always wearing your brother's pants and you never have cash, okay, um, but you have your brother's uh, debit card or credit card. If you want to use that to get your tickets for tonight, uh, you can do that. Uh, it's a separate line for using that versus using cash or check, all right? First time, we're going to test it, see how it works, uh, and uh, may provide us opportunities on down the road to use it as well. But uh, it's been something that people have been asking for for a while. Um, there, When you're in a business, you don't have to worry about who or what, when you're in a church, we have to worry about who or what, all right? And so it's a little more challenging than it is just for a business to use this, but we're going we're gonna to give it a test run today, okay? Uh, and so that will be available out in the pavilion as well. Lots of the raffle prizes are out already, not all of them, but a lot of them. Uh, there's things for kids, there's things for adults, things for men, things for women. It's terrific. Uh, and all this is going to help our 4th, uh, 5th, and 6th graders go to camp this summer. Uh, Let's see here, we have graduation Sunday next week, so we'll be recognizing all of our seniors. Most of them are going through graduation exercises uh, last week and this coming week, and uh, that's very exciting for them, and we will recognize them the following Sunday, and any college graduates we have in our church, we will also uh, recognize them that day. Uh, Widow's Lunch Bunch is next Sunday afternoon. The information is in your bulletin. Uh, also, a week from this Tuesday will be our, our seniors, not lunch this time, but a special event, all right? And so that information is in the bulletin. They're going to be going. Are they meeting here or meeting there? Okay, Botanical Gardens right over here at the corner of Clovis and Alluvial, all right? And uh, you will meet there. The information is your bulletin. You're going to have a grand time. Uh, I am so excited that we got this in early this time, uh, the Garden of Innocence Memorial Service. Some of you have heard me talk about that in the past. We often don't get the information until right beforehand, and a lot of people said, oh, if I'd have known sooner, I would have been there. Um, this is remembering abandoned and unnamed children and babies who have died. Uh, you do not realize how often this happens in our city, but uh, a young mother, sometimes not such a young mother, will give birth to a child that's stillborn, and they will just 
drop it off at a fire station. They will just drop the body off uh, at the ER and walk away. We have no idea the name. We have no idea the family. Uh, that happens, okay, frequently in the course of a year. And what used to happen is uh, those, those babies would be cremated and they would be left on a shelf somewhere in the corner building. Uh, there was a group of folks who got together, created this organization called the Garden of Innocence. And uh, now these babies are buried with respect and dignity. Um, each one of those babies are given a name that nobody gave them before. A poem or a song is written in tribute to them, and that is shared at this service. Uh, this is a cooperative event between funeral homes in the area. Mountain View Cemetery has designated an area there and fenced it off beautifully and uh, we actually have a service. I found out about it when I got a call from a gentleman who said this is something we do we would like for you to speak at at the memorial and that was about two years ago. Since then um, I've spoken a couple of times. Mark Addis uh, from our church spoke at the last one uh, and I'll be speaking at this one and um, what happens is it's anywhere from usually six to twelve babies uh, they're cremated. There's an organization that makes the beautiful boxes, puts their name on it. Um, the folks who show up make a big circle around the Garden of Innocence, and every single one of us get to hold that box and read that name, and it goes around the circle, and then it ends up at the cemetery, and they are placed in uh, their particular plot, all right, where their name will be. And uh, it's a very moving service. It gives dignity to those infants that uh, have great value in the eyes of the Lord. And, uh, and I'm glad in much of our community. So if you would like to attend that, it's going to be early because of the potential temperature. It's at 9 a.m. from beginning to end. It's probably a 45 to 50 minute service. All right. And uh, you are certain that it's open to the public. Mountain View Cemetery is the first one west of Highway 99 on Belmont. Most of you know where that area is. Um, the Triangle Drive-In. If you've been around Fresno along, you've probably had a burger at the Triangle Drive-In, all right? Um, and that's about the only good connection I can give to that neighborhood, all right? Uh, anything else I would say would probably not be most appropriate. So, but uh, anyway, it's a beautiful area they have there at Mountain View. Would love to have you come join us. A um, couple of clipboards that are going around. There's nothing new on here, uh, but they are important. One is Vacation Bible School. Uh, volunteers still needed in some areas so if you would like that's the top two sheets uh, here's the, I, I know this will disappoint some of you but all the teaching positions are taken but if you would like to assist in a classroom you would like to help with snacks you would like to help with um, uh, games you would like to help with setup or cleanup I know those don't sound that big but they both are very important setup it's important that everything looks good when the kids show up the first time and what we try to instill in all of our staff around here is this principle. The ministry is not over until the cleanup is finished. Okay? Uh, because we can't do the next ministry as long as there's still a mess. So ministry isn't completed until cleanup's done. So it's very, very important. So if you can help in any of those areas, put your name there. The next couple of sheets are uh, supplies that will be helpful for Vacation Bible School. What we did is we cleaned up that list because so many of you have taken care of most of them. All we put on the list today were those that were still empty, that somebody had not signed up for. Uh, and then the last two sheets have been there for a few weeks, and that's if you can help out on Thursday night with Celebrate Recovery. Uh, and you can read more about that in your bulletin as well. All right, a few prayer requests uh, that are not mentioned in your bulletin already. Diana Harrington was a 30-year math teacher at Clovis High School. Uh, a brilliant, brilliant lady. I, to my knowledge, I did not have the privilege of meeting her personally. I met her husband and her daughter on Friday afternoon and uh, had the opportunity to preach at her memorial service yesterday. Uh, there had been some confusion, and so I got pulled in at the last minute. I am so glad I did. I had a wonderful time with her husband, Ken, and their daughter, Kindia. Do you think that daughter is named after her mother and her father? Diana and Ken, Kindia, uh, I, think, I think named after both of them. Um, just a wonderful, wonderful lady and brilliant. Uh, I was out of my element in this crowd yesterday, all right? 30 years at Clovis High. And then the last three and a half years, she has been teaching math teachers at Fresno State University. 
This is a gal who loved her job, took it seriously, wanted to teach others how to be creative. She would go buy trash to use in teaching math. She wrote a best, recently, she co-authored a best-selling book on teaching mathematics through Google Docs. And it was the best number one selling book for two months on Amazon. And uh, just a great, she worked for our government. She, uh, she wrote an equation that is used in the success of our stealth bombers. She did other work with our government that she had to sign a contract that said she would not talk about it for 50 years. She kept her agreement. <laughs> she fulfilled it. Um, but just a, 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 a neat, neat lady, and I had a wonderful time, and I would appreciate you um, remembering to pray for the, for the Harrington family. I know, I know that they would appreciate that so, so very, very much. Um, she, she graduated from Salinas uh, in high school there, Alice Al. She went to uh, the junior college there, and then to Cal Poly, got her master's degree from Cal Poly, uh, met her husband while at Cal Poly, uh, and then this was hilarious. She had, she had been burned very badly, hurt deeply in a relationship while she was out at Cal Poly, and uh, she swore off men, okay? Uh, she was in the office one day, and one of the secretaries was trying to get her to get back into the dating world, and she said, absolutely no men in my life again. She said, with the exception of, I'll marry the next one who walks through that door. <laughs> On cue, Ken Harrington walks through the door. <laughs> they had never dated. They had met briefly in a math class. They got married seven months later. <laughs> and were married for 41 years. So absolutely. I, I asked the family, what are the mathematical probabilities that could have happened? And um, so anyway, just be remembering them. Uh, the Belcher family has been in Southern California, uh, service for their nephew, 24 years old, who died of cancer. Uh, that service was yesterday. I got a, um, uh, a text message uh, late yesterday evening from Robin Hustler, usually part of this service, usually sits towards the back. Her husband Thurman thought he had strep throat, went to see his doctor. They ran a couple of tests. They got a call at home on Friday to hurry up and get to the hospital. They did emergency surgery on him. Yesterday apparently was a very tough day, but I got an update uh, between services saying he has vastly improved and they are going to release him sometime this afternoon. So that's good news. We still don't know what the biopsy results is, but he is definitely better. Billy Harris is Tasha Gray, a lady from our congregation. This is her brother, and he is at Clovis Community Hospital. He has been in a medicine-induced coma for the last 48 hours while they're trying to figure out what caused the problems he's going through, but they are very, very serious. So uh, if you'd remember Billy Harris. So those are a few of the updates that were not in your bulletin. I'm gonna ask our ushers to come forward if they would please and come wait on us as we have our morning tithes and offering. Gentlemen, would you come? Would you join with me as we pray? Father, I wanna thank you so much for the life that you share with us. I want to thank you that you not only have the desire to forgive us of all our sin, but Father, once that is accomplished, you have the desire to come live within us, to do for us every moment of every day what we could never possibly do for ourselves. That is to live out the life that looks like you. So, Father, you want us, our hands to be your hands, our feet to be your feet, our lips to be your lips, and you come to live within us. That's a, gr uh, that's a thing that we learn how to do I wished it was instantaneous, but Father, day by day, moment by moment, we learn to surrender our wills, our desires to you. And Father, when we do that, then you give to us the delight of our heart. Thank you for that. We trust you with the needs we've expressed here today from those who are in the hospital. Give wisdom to the doctors and give uh, healing strength to their bodies. For those who've experienced loss of their lives, may they experience your comfort and um, your cure for grief. And uh, the scripture tells us that you will transform our season of mourning to a day of joy. And so we pray for that in their lives. For the privilege of giving and sharing today, we say thank you. In the awesome name of your son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Hey, guys. Uh, two more weeks, we're going to wrap up the series we've been on, Two Weeks of the Heart. Uh, so next Sunday, the following Sunday, uh, we'll wrap things up. And what I would like to do is, on that last Sunday, I would like to have copies of the book available uh, that this series has come from. Now, the person didn't come out of the scriptures, but as uh, one of my favorite authors and pastors, uh, Andy Stanley, put it together in a book called Enemies of Our Heart. 
uh, breaking free from the four emotions that control you. Uh, Major Thomas told us many, many years ago here at the home in one of his sermons that people only remember 10% of what they hear. Uh, it says I'm on. Oh, it's in the middle. Well, yeah, no, three lights on. Boom, boom. Testing one, two, three, four. Testing one, two. Let me have some batteries. Really? And it's green? Got red, yeah, got green light. See right there? Green light. Green Do you see that green light? Yeah. Green light. Green light. This is actually part of a comedy routine you've been working on. Pull this out, so that's my room. Testing, one, two, three, four. All right. Oh, my new superhero. Um, went and saw Wonder Woman this week. She pales in comparison to Shelly. This will be a good day today. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, Major Thomas said, we only remember 10% of what we hear, so he would say, so I'm going to say 10 times the important stuff. I'm going to repeat it 10 times. Well, uh, I repeat a lot, try to give you updates from week to week to, 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 to kind of get this in your head, but I know it would be great to be able to go back from time to time and read about what you've heard, all right? When you read what you've heard, our retention is much better. So... Uh, I want to find out because I need to call Harry this week and get him ordered so they could be here. I'm going to guess it's going to be between ten and fifteen dollars, and our policy here usually is ten, fifteen, or free. Okay, uh, ten, fifteen, or free, or fifteen, ten, or free. Ten, well, but and this one might go. This one, this might be ten, fifteen, or free. All right. Um, so anyway, okay, maybe it won't be such a good day now. I'm arguing with her in public. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, if you think you would like to secure a copy at the end of this series, so I order enough, would you raise your hand? You think you would like to get a copy of this, all right, at the end. So, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 25, 26, okay, about 35 in here, added to the 20 in the 8 o'clock crowd, so about 55 is what we're up to. All right, uh, I got to tell you guys, this has become my go-to book in almost all my counseling. Uh, whether it's one-on-one -on -one counseling for some personal reasons, whether it's couples counseling that we're doing because there's some marital challenges, uh, I have found great resources in here that are good for all of those. So uh, I think it's a great resource to have, uh, have in your home. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I took a break from the series, and I, I, I preached a sermon on God winks at you. All right. Um, I, I, I caught another God wink this week. Um, God winks are those things that are kind of unexplainable, those, uh, the timing of things kind of like a guy walking through a door when saying, I'm going to marry the next guy through the door. That, that was a gigantic God wink, all right, for that couple. Uh, but I have one of those God winks. We're on the subject of jealousy. Today, we're going to be looking at the habit that overcomes jealousy. And in the middle of this week, uh, I was home watching the second half. Uh, I missed the first half, but I saw the second half of the Warriors uh, slip by the Cavaliers. Hey, we, we, we did the same thing last year, so let's, we, let's maintain humility. Um, and, 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 and so when it was over, it was a little early to go to bed, uh, and, and so I kind of flipped through, you know, the TV guide, what do I want to watch? Well, Last Man Standing was on. All right, so I thought I'll watch Last Man Standing. Guess what the subject of Last Man Standing was? Jealousy. Jealousy. All right, let me set this up. I'm, we're going to show you a quick clip of it. Let me set this up. Um, 
one of the girls in Tim Allen's family has a new soccer coach. He's a hunk. All the girls in his family, the sisters and his wife, all right, think the new soccer coach is gorgeous. So that's the background. You're going to see one of the daughters coming in to apologize to her boyfriend for slobbering all over the new coach. All right? So that's the background to this short clip that we're going to watch. You know, jealousy is so insidious, all right, that we don't even recognize how desperate we look when either we're jealous or we want somebody else to be jealous. And so I think it's one of the reasons that it's one of the four significant enemies of our heart. Over the last couple of months, we've looked at the enemy of guilt and anger and greed. Last week, we finished looking at how ugly jealousy is from a biblical and personal perspective. And today, we're going to look at what is the habit that we can develop in our life that overcomes jealousy. I have to admit that I think it's easier to own up to being angry than it is to being jealous. You see, jealousy always seems so petty. Case in point. I could build a case for my anger, but as soon as I open up my mouth to talk about my feelings of jealousy, I feel like I'm back in junior high. So we just don't talk about these things. But we certainly feel it. I feel it when I see books that somebody's written about a subject I had the idea five years before. I feel it when somebody else preaches an incredible sermon and I wished I'd preached it. I feel it when I'm walking on a beach in my t-shirt and I see a shirtless guy who's got nothing to hide walk by. Yeah, then I'm supposed to shut up. Um, Last night, I uh, decided to clean my closet to get some things out. Um, there's about a half a dozen pair of pants that um, are not worn out. Um, <laughs> dry cleaners has done damage to them, and they, they, they don't fit well anymore. Um, Shelly chose to come to bed at the same time I was doing that. And um, she was so kind. Um, she said, honey, it's okay. We'll go to the store and get some bigger pants for you. <laughs> I thought, you know, I wonder how it would go over if I said, babe, it's okay. We'll go to the store and get some bigger dresses for you. Uh, <laughs> but, but I did not say that. You see, there are a few things, a few other things that probably stir up feelings of jealousy in me, but I've probably already self-disclosed enough for today. Now, that stuff may sound harmless enough, but when we let those kind of things go too far, it's not harmless at all. You see, jealousy is extremely dangerous. Jealousy is extremely dangerous because it shapes our attitude towards other people. And God is the one who wants to be the shaper of our attitudes. He says, love others the way I love them. He says, love others the way you love yourself. He says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But jealousy gets into our life it gets control of us, and it shapes our attitudes towards others. It's hard to actively love somebody that we're jealous of. It's hard to serve or submit to someone who's a constant reminder of who we're not. And eventually, jealousy takes control of our attitudes towards people who've done nothing wrong or nothing more than pull ahead of us in a race they're not even aware of that they're in. They've excelled in an area that we've deemed important for ourselves, and we hate them for it. Okay, maybe hate's a strong word. We just don't enjoy their company much. Without any real effort on our part, jealousy crosses the border into resentment. 
But resentment needs justification, so we go looking for it. And once we find it, we feel safe then. There's no need to resolve our feelings of jealousy because they're perfectly justified. You see, once jealousy turns to resentment, our jealousy knows no bounds. It has the power to sour our attitudes towards entire categories of people. We can become jealous of all rich people, of all supermodels, of bodybuilders. Internet now. Um, you know if you're on internet, internet has a profile of you. You understand that, right? You understand based on things that you search on Google, they're able to put together a pretty good profile of who you are. Okay, because for a period of time I was looking at a lot of health places, okay, looking for how you deal with stents, those kind of things, uh, what you eat, you know, that would be better to make you heart healthy. Um, now all of a sudden, over the past several months, now ads start popping up. These are things that you haven't looked for, not things you've asked for, but they've got a profile. They know about me that I am a male. They know about me that I'm over 60, they know about me that I've got some questions regarding health things. So from that, they've made a few assumptions. So now I'm getting this ad pop up frequently from Tony. Tony's got a picture of him. He's solid gray hair, kind of like Mike Rude. Solid gray hair. He is shirtless. He's got six-pack abs, and he's got a 20-something on his arm. And they say, the, the ad says, do you want abs like Tony? <laughs> and I think most people who look at Tony are not interested in his abs, all right? <laughs> I hate that. I didn't ask for it, but I get it. So you know what? I hate all 60-plus-year-old bodybuilders now <laughs> because I don't have a six-pack. I have a keg, all right? And, and I don't like it. It's disgusting. I could get more personal. How about mega church pastors? How about some of you ladies who feel like you're forced to work and so you're jealous of stay at home moms? How about some of you stay at home moms who are jealous of career women? It's suddenly easy to write off an entire swath of the human race because of our jealousy. So I got a couple of questions. Who are you jealous of? And maybe some of you quickly say, nobody. And you might be correct. But what about resentment? Here's the question that might bring to light some heretofore. Don't you love that word? Three small words put together to make one big word. Heretofore. So, here's some heretofore undiscovered jealousy. What category of people do you secretly resent? Dig around a bit in your soul. Who and what really raises the hackles on your spine? Professionals, performers, company executives, folks who were married, folks who were happily married. Singles, children, retirees, rich, popular. Look deeper and you might discover resentment. With all of its shallow justifications, it's really a cover for jealousy. Chances are you'll find this jealousy began over one incident with one individual somewhere in your past. Let's see if I can connect a few more dots this morning. Continue to dig beneath the surface and we will discover that our jealousy is just a manifestation of the fact that we are not getting what we want. What complicates things is that our dissatisfaction gets reflected off of those who are around us. But some people aren't the source of our problem any more than the moon is the source of our light. They are just reflecting back at us what has originated in our own heart. You see, ridding our hearts of jealousy begins with this significant recognition. The reason I resent her, the reason I resent him, has nothing to do with him or her. The problem is, I don't have what I want. 
Some of you might remember this TV program. I don't think it was on long, but it was called, What Would You Do? What Would You Do? Uh, this is a program that put actors into everyday situations with hidden cameras to see what people around them would do. One of the programs sent an actor into a grocery store. The actor asks if he could cut in line. He's in a big hurry. When he gets up to the checkout, lights and music start playing. A clerk runs out with a gigantic $500 check saying, you are our one millionth customer. You are our winner today. The fun part was watching the person right behind them who let them cut in. <laughs> Many of them in that scenario were angry and furious. That guy just took my prize money. It should have been me. One guy threw his stuff on the counter and stormed out of the store. One woman ran to the service desk to raise, well, not heaven. It's difficult for us to see others' blessings without the why not me attitude. Ridding the heart of jealousy begins with taking a long, hard look in our own mirror. We are not to look across the street or across the aisle or across the table at somebody else. Focusing our emotion on somebody else fans the flame of jealousy. Focusing on our own hearts begins with the process of quenching it. Once we've isolated the problem, the rest is pretty simple. Uh, not easy, but simple. It's much like coming to know Jesus Christ. It is simple, but it's not easy. You see, to have to admit that I am a sinner... Because particularly in America, 21st century, it's all about comparisons. I am not as bad as, I've never been to prison. I've never got a DUI. I, I, I give to good causes. I, I volunteer for good projects. Surely I'm going to heaven. No, you're not. You're not. You go to heaven on one thing and one thing alone. The mercy and grace of Jesus Christ that you have appropriated for your life. Without that appropriation for your life, you are not good enough to go there. You see, the only one good enough to go was Jesus. So it takes Jesus in you and Jesus in me. And so to become a Christian, it's not easy for us to admit, I am a sinner and I need a Savior. It is simple. It's a three-step process. Admit I'm a sinner. Ask forgiveness for my sin and invite him to come live within my life. It's not, it's not rocket science. I don't need a math, math, mathematical equation to figure that out. But it is simple. Focusing our emotion on somebody else fans the flames of jealousy. Focusing on our own hearts begins the process of healing it. Once we've isolated the problem, the rest is pretty simple. We take our old car. We take our smaller house. We take our hand-me-down dining rooms. We take our 40-inch waist. Mine's not 40 yet. Shelly was online looking up pants <laughs> while I was getting rid of some. <laughs> Look, you can get these. And as she went to a bigger waist size, she kept the same length size. I said, no, dear, when the waist gets bigger, the length gets shorter. <laughs> I don't th know if it works that way in girls' stuff, but in guys' stuff, when the waistline gets bigger, our legs get shorter. <laughs> and... Um, there was a time I used to laugh when I would hear my dad's pant size because the waist was a bigger number than the length. And I thought, that will never happen to me. <laughs> it is. <laughs> so we take this stuff that we don't like our dead-end job, our lack of musical talent, our less-than-stellar SAT scores, and we take these things to the only one who could done something about it. And once we get all this gathered up in one big pile of discontentment, we need to pour our hearts out to him. All of our frustration, all of our discontent, let God know that we know that he could have done better by us. That's cowboy talk for saying like this, something like this. You could have provided better, given me better, and while you were at it, upgraded a few of these body parts. <laughs> Go ahead and tell God how unhappy you've been with the way that he made you and has treated you. Go ahead and tell God that, because you know what? He can handle it better than I can. And because you're right, 
God could have done all those other things for you. After all, he may have done it for your, your brother or your sister. He did it for Tony. Heck, look down the street at the pagans who live on your block. Look what they own and drive and have and look like. Th then summarize your prayer to the Lord like this. Lord, to sum this whole thing up, I think you owe me. Now, if you find that a bit daunting, to look God in the eye and accuse him of owing you something, guess what? You are on the verge of a breakthrough. If you really do think that God has mistreated you and, in fact, owes you something, then my suggestion is go read the New Testament. Jesus, along with a host of others, make it perfectly clear that we were goners hopelessly separated from God. But God had mercy and gave us exactly what we did not deserve, his forgiveness at what price? His son's life. And the truth is, we owed God a debt we couldn't pay, so he paid it for us, thereby erasing forever the possibility of him owing us anything. Our disappointment with not getting what we want or believe we deserve pales in significance next to the fact that we have been given what we needed most. In the shadow of the cross, it's very clear, God owes us nothing. And we owe him everything, including an apology. An apology for holding him to a debt he does not owe. A debt we held against him but failed to recognize in our own confusion and whirlwinds of emotions that come along with this thing called jealousy. At the heart of jealousy is the lie that God owes me stuff. Ridding ourselves of jealousy requires that we face up to and expel this dangerous notion. And having done so, we will be free to move unhindered in the direction that God wants to take us in life. God's unconditional acceptance and grace is the very reason we can bring all of our disappointments and all of our dissatisfactions to him with boldness. Again, nothing is too small and nothing is too big to bring into the presence of God. We don't have to qualify or quantify or explain or feel guilty for how we feel about how we feel. The writer of Hebrews gives us an extraordinary promise in regards to this. Write these verses down, all right? These are two good verses for you to learn. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. Hebrews 4, 15 and 16. Now, I'm going to do something weird. I'm going to read 16 first. Okay, I'm going to read 16 first, then we'll read 15. Here's, here's what 16 says. Let us approach God's throne of grace. How? With confidence. The old King James says, with boldness. For what purpose? So that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. You feeling jealous about somebody? Tell God you're experiencing jealousy and you hate the fact they got something you don't. Tell him and do it boldly because there we will find mercy and grace to overcome it. You see, when we come to God with our disappointment and our discontentment, that is exactly what we find, not condemnation, not judgment. We find mercy and grace. Why? Well, the preceding verse, verse 15, explains the why. Why? For we do not have a high priest. Jesus is our high priest. And we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness. Why? Because we have one who has been tempted in every way, just like us, yet he did not sin. Jesus understands how we feel. So bring to him our feelings as ugly and raw as they are and do it with boldness. And there we will find mercy and grace to overcome them. When we bring our wishes and our wants, our dreams and our disappointments to our Heavenly Father, we're bringing them to the only one who's able to understand and do something about it. We have a Savior who has been touched with the same emotions that leave us wondering if we can go on. We can only come to his throne unapologetically, boldly, lay those burdens down to his feet, and he's the only one who can do anything about it. Now that's just the starters. Once we've wrestled with our jealousy and we've put it to the mat internally, there's something we can do externally that creates a new habit that will keep jealousy in check and hopefully out of our lives. 
If you'll recall, over the last couple of months as we've looked at the four enemies of our heart, guilt, anger, greed, and now jealousy, we have also discovered a new habit to keep those enemies at bay or completely eliminate them from our life. With guilt, we said the antidote was to exercise confession. Confess to the Lord, confess to each other for those things that we've done wrong. The habit that overcomes our anger is forgiveness. Receiving forgiveness and giving forgiveness, not only between us and God, but also between each other. Greed is overcome by a generous heart and generous giving. And the habit that will enable us to strengthen our hearts against jealousy, are you ready? Is celebration. Celebration. Celebrate. To guard our hearts against jealousy, we must choose to celebrate the success, the size, and the stuff of those we've tended to envy. We need to go out of our way to verbally express our congratulation over their accomplishments. This must become a habit. Celebrating the success of those we envy will allow us to conquer those emotions that have the potential to drive a wedge into our relationships. A surefire way to know that we have a problem with jealousy is when we celebrate a person's failures more than we do their successes. Have you ever had anybody in your life that you couldn't wait for them to fail and you privately rejoiced over it? Yeah, most of us have at some time or another. If we acknowledge that this is an issue, we're on our way to success, particularly when we learn to celebrate theirs. Listen to Andy Stanley, the one who wrote the book, tell his own personal story. He said, author and gifted speaker, Louis Giglio. How many of you have ever heard of Louis? All right, hopefully you have. He's, he's a great writer. He's, a, he's even a better speaker, all right? Guy is a gifted communicator. And he's one of Andy Stanley's best friends, and that's who Andy's talking about. And Andy says, we've been friends since the sixth grade. We met under a bunk bed during a shaving cream war at youth camp. Throughout high school, that's why you send your kids to camp. You never know who they'll meet, okay? Throughout high school and college, we were inseparable. We preached our first sermons back-to-back -back on a mission trip. After seminary, he went to Baylor University to pursue an additional degree while I went back to Atlanta to look for a job. Two years later, he was speaking to thousands of college students every Monday night. I was taking junior high kids to Six Flags. Eventually, Louie and his wife Shelly settled back in Atlanta. And fortunately for me, they chose to make North Point their church home. I say fortunately because for several years, Louie graciously agreed to preach a couple of sermon series every year at our Atlanta campuses. Now, if you've ever heard Louis speak, you'll understand when I say he's one of the most effective, most sought-out communicators in America. He's uniquely gifted and called. I've never heard anybody take an audience into the presence of God like Louis. I've seen him in front of high school students, college students, adults, leaders. It doesn't matter who he's speaking to. It's an incredible experience. So when I would announce to our congregation that Louis would be preaching for the next couple of weeks, people would cheer. On the Sundays that he would speak, attendance would bump up significantly. And then during the week that followed, I would constantly be asked, Hey, Andy, did you hear Louie? He was amazing, wasn't he? Which, of course, he was. This made for a climate fraught with the potential for jealousy. Between preachers, some of you say? <laughs> oh, you bet there is. There's not a more jealous place than a Bible college with a bunch of young preachers. Trust me. But in our defense, the potential for professional jealousy is ratched up a knot in a profession that involves performance. And whether or not you like to think of preaching as performing, there is an aspect of it that that is true. So preachers are prone to be jealous of each other. What makes our situations more volatile the most is that in the little town of Alpharetta, Georgia, where we reside, remember this is Andy talking, there are people who would rather hear Louie than me. Frankly, I would rather hear him than me. And there are people who prefer me to Louie. Primarily, it's my relatives. <laughs> so people talk and compare and express disappointment when they're expecting to hear one of us and it ends up being the other one. And all of that is natural and normal. But as you can imagine, this creates a potential for some unhealthy competition. To complicate matters even further, Louie's frequent involvement at North Point led some to believe that he was part of our church staff. In truth, Louis is the founder of his own incredible ministry called Passion. He travels all over the world doing Passion conferences, and these gatherings are a catalyst for spiritual awakening. In addition, he has a record label that uh, many of the premier worship leaders in the country have been on. His scope of ministry exceeds 
What Andy said is my local church level, but a lot of people in our community didn't know that. So with all that swirling around the background, I'm sure you can imagine what people assumed when Louie announced he was starting a church in Atlanta. For a while, the responses bordered on ridiculous. The disappointing part was that many assumed his church initiative signaled some kind of break in our friendship. Dozens of people approached me during the weeks following the announcement and said, so how do you feel about Louie planning to start a church in your backyard? Several pastors called me to let me know they were disappointed in his decision that they were praying for me. People took up an offense on my behalf, an offense, honestly, I never harbored. But I could have. I'm not immune to jealousy, and neither is Louis. But we know how destructive it can be, and we know the antidote. I'm Louis's biggest fan, and I believe that Louis is my biggest fan. Neither of us is hesitant to tell the other person and the people around us how we feel about each other. Case in point, Andy said, I ran into Louis a few days after his return from a tour in South Africa where more than 9,000 students flocked to his events. Before I could ask him about his trip, he put his arm around my shoulder and said, Andy, you wouldn't believe it. Everywhere I went, people were talking about you and the impact of North Point. What makes this so remarkable is that I know preachers who won't stop talking about all the wonderful things they have done in the world. But that's not Louis. He made it a point to tell me he discovered about my impact, not his, to celebrate my success, not his. I've listened to every sermon Louis delivered at our church. When I was in town, I would sit on the front row, sometimes for two or three services, and yeah, I could experience twinges of jealousy over his creativity and his insights, and he's a lot cooler and hip than I'll ever be but I'm not about to let any of that drive a wedge in our friendship. So I keep celebrating what God is doing through Louis, and Louis affirms me as well. On September 19th, 2010, Louis's mom slipped quietly out of this world and went to be with the Lord. Andy said, I was at the hospital with Louis and a few family members. We held hands and we prayed around her bedside. It was a Sunday afternoon, and Louis was supposed to preach at his church, Passion City Church. That evening, around 3.30, Louis looked at me in the hospital room with his mom and said, I don't want to leave my mama. Would you go preach for me tonight? I told him I would. Truth is, I was honored to. About 30 minutes before the service began that evening, his mama said her final goodbye to this world. And my friend Louis was where he needed to be, and so was I. Perhaps your response to all this is, well, Tim, that's just great about Andy and Louie. Sounds like they've got quite the mutual admiration society going there in Georgia. I'm happy for them, but that's not how I feel about all the people around me. Am I supposed to celebrate their success if I don't mean it? You want to know what the short answer is? Yes, you are. You are. I'm not asking you to be insincere. I'm asking you to be honest. I mean, does your sister look good in that dress? to tell her she looks good in that dress. If she doesn't, you're off the hook. <laughs> Do you like your brother-in-law's new car? Ford Raptor truck? <laughs> if so, tell him. If not, then... You're off the hook. Did, did your partner do a good job on that presentation at work? Did you find yourself wishing you were doing that instead of him? Then tell him he did a good job. That's not being insincere. You're being honest. However, if he was good and you can't bring yourself to compliment him, that is a problem. If your partner built the house of your dreams, tell him. It's true. Expressing the truth helps us to free us from the emotional bondage that is such an integral part of jealousy. When we walk up to the guy who got the promotion instead of us, say, congratulations. When we do that, we're refusing to allow the dangerous emotions of jealousy to control our behavior. We are protecting our hearts. We are saying no to bad habits that create jealousy. It's much easier, listen to this, this is key. It's much easier to behave our way into a new way of thinking than to think our way into a new way of behaving. Did you get that? I'm going to say it one more time. It's much easier to behave our way into a new way of thinking than to think our way into a new way of behaving. I sit on the couch frequently and think about exercise. <laughs> thinking doesn't do one bit of good. 
Don't wait until you feel like celebrating. Celebrate until you feel like it. Rid our hearts of the destructive forces of jealousy. Refuse to be taken prisoner by, by emotions that don't reflect reality. There is something powerful and liberating about celebrating the success of other people. Let me wrap this up. Whose success have you been hesitant to celebrate recently? Who deserves a pat on the back and you haven't given it to them? Who deserves a letter, an email, a phone call from you, a hug? Whose progress have you mentally chalked up to luck and therefore refused to acknowledge? Whose achievements have brought to the surface some insecurities in your own life? Insecurities that have prompted you to shy away from celebrating their big win. Isn't it time we developed a new habit? Isn't it time we refuse to give in to the negative emotions that well up in us when others succeed? Instead of saying nothing or being critical, what if we made it the habit of our life to publicly celebrate the success of others? And when that person's success has the potential to reflect negatively on us, Celebrate even more. I guarantee you, this is a habit that will change everything in your life. I want to make one suggestion as we wrap this up. If you've never studied closely the Old Testament character of Joseph, and you want to do a little study on your own, the subject of jealousy, you want to dig a little deeper, Go read during the course of this week, Genesis chapter 37 through 45, 46 chapters. That's, that's seven or eight chapters. It's not a long story. Many of you know it. Joseph got the coat of many colors. Joseph had the dream that his older brothers were going to bow down to him. Joseph was, Joseph was pretty near the perfect son. He was not the greatest brother when he was young. He, 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 his only problem is he boasted about, I, I don't think he meant to, it was just his immaturity, he boasted about what both God the Father and his own father had done for him. But I want you to see how destructive jealousy was in the lives of his brothers. And I want you to see how Joseph chose to respond ultimately to that jealousy which tried to destroy him. Some people say that Joseph is a type, an Old Testament image of the Messiah that was to come. You want a glimpse of what Jesus was going to be like, study the life of Joseph. Uh, J. Sidlow Baxter made these three observations about Joseph. He said he was the beloved son of his father. He says he was the rejected servant in Potiphar's house, and he was the exalted savior of the nation of Israel. Isn't that who Jesus was? Jesus was the beloved son of his heavenly father. Jesus was the rejected servant of the nation of Israel. And Jesus was the exalted savior of the world. The way that he was despised, Joseph, for doing what was right, certainly pictures the Lord Jesus Christ. It would be a good study. You see, jealousy is made up of the word lousy. J-E-A. L-O-U-S-Y, lousy. Jealousy certainly is lousy. I see jealousy and selfishness almost as being first cousins. They are words that are much, much more alike than different. A jealous person is probably a self-centered person, and a self-centered person is probably jealous. They envy someone else because they think whatever is happening to someone else should be happening to them. And do you want to overcome that in your life? And what's the answer? What's the habit? Say it louder. Celebrate. One more time, a little bit louder. Celebrate. Celebrate! And this afternoon, write a letter, make a phone call, give a hug to somebody you know you need to. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your wisdom from Scripture that helps us overcome the enemies of our heart. And I pray that we will begin to put into practice what we've been learning in recent months, the need and necessity for confession, the importance of forgiveness, the liberating truth of generosity, and Father, the freeing of our emotions of jealousy as we celebrate the success of others. Thank you so much for these lessons. May we not forget them, and may we choose to remember them. 
In Jesus' name we pray, amen.